Good morning. My name is Greg Jones. We'll be reading from Exodus 3 in the New Living Translation. Man, I stepped on my glasses yesterday. So I have two sorts of glasses I can wear. It's bright, bright enough that this may work. Well, they're bifocal, so <laughs> if you bear with me in my cool look. Exodus 3, verse 7 to 14. Then the Lord told him, You can be sure I have seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries for deliverance from their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come to rescue them from the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own good and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites live. The cries of the people of Israel have reached me, and I have seen how the Egyptians have oppressed them with heavy tasks. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You will lead my people, the Egyptians, out of Egypt. But who am I to appear before Pharaoh, Moses asked God. How can you expect me to lead the Israelites out of Egypt? Then God told him, I will be with you, and this will serve as proof that I have sent you. When you have brought the Israelites out of Egypt, you will return here to worship God at this very mountain. But Moses protested. If I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they won't believe me. They will ask, which God are you talking about? What is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied, I am the one who always is. Just tell them, I am has sent me to you. Exodus 4 verse 1. But Moses protested again. Look, they won't believe me. They won't do what I tell them. They'll just say, the Lord never appeared to you. Exodus 4, 8 to 13. If they do not believe the first miraculous sign, they will believe the second, the Lord said. And if they do not believe you, even after these two signs, then take some water from the Nile River and pour it out on the dry ground. When you do it, it will turn into blood. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, Oh, Lord, I'm just not a good speaker. I never have been, and I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not now, even after you have spoken to me. I'm clumsy with words. Who makes mouths, the Lord asked him. Who makes people so they can speak? or not speak, hear, or not hear, see, or not see. Is it not I, the Lord? Now go and do as I have told you. I will help you speak well, and I will tell you what to say. But Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send someone else. Good morning, Redeemers. How you guys doing this morning? Good. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Charlie Del Bosque. Give him a hand. This is Charlie's first preach here. Yeah. And, uh, and we're excited to have him. I, uh, I've come to admire Charlie. He's got a huge heart, uh, a great gentle spirit, and a willingness to serve even when he's uncomfortable, which is really our, our, what we're talking about today. You know, he is, I've constantly had to call him names and push him and uh, until he finally did things, but he's always willing. Yeah. And, uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. True. True. <laughs> and uh, so I just want you guys to give him uh, your ears, your eyes, uh, you know, and, and just <clears throat> bless him today as Redeemers because this is his first go and it is a it is a hard task. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Getting up here, it's, sure. it's nerve-wracking. And so let's give him a warm Redeemer's welcome. Thank you. 
All right. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. Morning, Redeemers. Um, so like Nick said, my name is Charlie. I've been attending Redeemers for about two and a half years, along with my wonderful wife, Celinda. And um, we have two children, Marilyn Rose, she's 10, and then we have a um, terrorist, I mean toddler, <laughs> whose name is Charles Zane. He's a year and a half. Um, yeah, he really stresses our love. Um, but anyways, uh, we serve in Kid Venture, and we also, um, for two years, we have led a life group uh, with amazing people, like Greg. So, um, all right, so enough about me. We'll just get on with the, with the sermon. So anybody ready for some lies? Yeah? No? No, of course not. So in this series today, we're still in the series, uh, The Lies We Believe. Um, we are presented with this lie that I have personally been deceived by, and maybe some of you guys have been deceived by too. It's, today's lie is, God can't use me until I'm spiritually better. And it's, it's a lie. But um, first we just go to the lie and we, we ask, you know, well, what does it mean to be spiritually better? Maybe some of us might say, having a deeper knowledge of God, Reading, a bio, reading the Bible on a daily basis, or maybe having a stronger prayer life, or even one that's existent, right? Um, how about memorizing some Bible verses? Depending on God more, or maybe even going to church more often than you do now. See, all of these things, if achieved or gained, we might say, yeah, that can make us spiritually better. Or at least headed in the right direction. You know, I think we can all agree on that. But what if we don't have all or most of those boxes checked? We might start to feel like we're not enough or we don't measure up, especially, you know, in God's kingdom. And this may expose our insecurities. Love those insecurities. We focus on them so much that it beats us down to the point that we just stay spiritually, struck, spiritually stuck, never moving forward in our walk with Christ. So has anybody ever been approached with um, a serving opportunity here at church? You know, the kind that makes you feel a little uneasy or out of your element? And when you sit back, you kind of say, "Woo, no, nah, not me. I'm not qualified. There's no way I can do that. You know, it, it would take a qualified person, maybe somebody spiritually better. So have you ever been asked? See, this church here would never do that to you. They'd never make you feel uncomfortable. Yeah. It's not like they have T-shirts that say, get uncomfortable, right? <laughs> so what's usually our initial answer? Like, no. Nope, not me. Got to find somebody else. Somebody else better. Or how many of us have um, mastered the art of the Christian no? You know, brother, you know, sister, I'll just have to pray on it and wait on the Lord. <laughs> and you know darn well that that answer is no. But two minutes after waiting on the Lord, you know, you just come back with, yeah, it's just not God's timing, brother. Sorry. You know, it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, whether you are new to faith or have been a Christian for a long time. This lie has the ability to keep us from answering God's call or even believing that we have a call. You see, everyone is called. But this lie, God can't use me until I'm spiritually better, tricks us to thinking that only the Christians that are spiritually better can go and be used by God. But that isn't true. We are all called. Every Christian has a call, and every call awaits an answer. So there is an answer we're going to have to give. In today's text, we see Moses has come face to face with the one true God, Yahweh being given a task that he does not want to do because he doesn't feel qualified, right? So you see from 
the time he was born to about the age of 40, Moses lived in Egypt. He was in, the, uh, in Pharaoh's household, so he was doing all right. But one day, the Bible says that he walked out and saw the burdens of his people. So he knew he was a Hebrew. And he saw an Egyptian man beating a Hebrew. So he looked around, left and right, making sure nobody was looking, and he killed that Egyptian. He hid the body in the sand. And the next day, the Bible says that he walks out again, and he sees two Hebrew men this time fighting. Knowing that those are his people, he walks up, and he, says, and he goes to the guy that's in the wrong, and he says, Hey, why do you strike your companion? Well, the Hebrew man knew what he had did, and he said, well, Who made you judge over us? What, are you going to kill me like you did the Egyptian? And right then and there, Moses knew that everyone knew about what he had done. He was a murderer. So before Pharaoh um, can get his hands on him, he got out of Dodge. And, uh, and he left. So uh, he finds himself now in Midian. So he's a fugitive now. And he's in Midian. There he settles down for the next 40 years. And he had a wife and two sons. So he went from being in Egyptian royalty, you know, in a palace, to a pasture shepherding his father-in-law's flock. So now he's 80 years old. He's talking to God through a burning bush, being called back to Egypt to go bring God's people out. Now Moses makes all these excuses and objections of why he can't be the one to accomplish this task for God. And just like Moses, when we as Christians are presented with a call to serve or to move forward in our walk with Christ, we allow this lie to creep in, and it takes place in our thoughts and our beliefs and our insecurities and our doubts that are formed by our past or even our present. They aid us in making all these different excuses. So in our text this morning, when Moses says, you know, who am I that I should go, God? You know, some of us Christians have that reply too, where he doesn't seem important enough. So we say, well, we can't be used by God because I'm not important enough. You know, I've only been going to church for six months, and they want us to lead a what? A life group? You know, maybe, maybe, no, 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 not us, not us. You know, God, they're, they're asking, you know, they're asking for us, right? Like, we're, we're nobodies. You know, or maybe they should, uh, you know, I should tell my wife, hey, go, go send an email. Tell them get somebody from the prayer team. You know, maybe the worship team. They're, they got to be way more qualified than us. That's a phone. They're more like this now, right? So. Oh, what's that? Am I interested in being an overseer? What's an overseer? Nah, that's not for me. Nah, I couldn't do something like that. All right. Okay, I just turn wrenches and fix stuff. Okay. All right. See you, Nick. That may have happened, may have not. I'm not sure. Oh, there you go. Use one of the overseers. See? Use them. They're important. So God, I'm just going to sit right here, okay? You know, I got my Bible. And I'll just let those important people be used by you. You know, they're already leading anyways. They're already, you know, doing stuff at church for you anyways. Just use them. And maybe our, our, next, our next excuse, because we don't know enough. You know, we haven't been in church that long. So we say, God, you can't use me because I'm not churchy enough. You know, and just like Moses, he was saying, you know, well, who, who are you? I, who do I say sent me? You know, well, I haven't been in church long enough. You know, I don't have that church lingo. I don't talk the way church people talk. 
I'm not privy to the thus and thous and the, and the KJV style. Maybe you can't articulate the gospel like one of today's great preachers. Or maybe don't even know the proper order for communion. You know, is it the wafer or the juice? We better ask some of those spiritually better people, right? They know. Maybe because you don't know enough about God, you know, you, you make the excuse, well, I'm not a theologian and, or uh, I've never been to seminary. Or I've never even taken a formation class here at Redeemers, which is just churchy words for guy, guy who studies God or person who studies God and God college and a God class. It's more terminology we don't know. We probably think of possible scenarios where someone, where we're talking to someone about God or maybe serving somewhere or leading something, and someone has this question that we do not have the answer to. That's pretty scary. That is, it's been one of my downfalls of, of not wanting to serve. Because we don't want to look like the person who doesn't know. See, oh, they just think I'm dumb. It could be true. <laughs> but it'll make us feel less than. We say to God, so since I'm not churchy enough, I'll just need to learn more about you before you can use me. So I'll just be back over here, God. I got my Bible and my coffee just got here. And we'll just let the important churchy people be used by you, God. At one point in our text, or the next, argue, or the next excuse that Moses gives, he says, well, what if they don't believe me? Maybe he's thinking of what people still think about him back in Egypt. And so our excuse turns into, well, God, you can't use me because I'm not redeemed enough. Maybe we have been told in the past that we weren't perfect. So how could, how could we ever tell people about Jesus? Some of us might have a past that we're not too proud of. We made some mistakes in life, some little, some big. But now that we're saved and following Christ, we may feel that others will only focus on our past to discredit our relationship with Christ. And once again, these thoughts, these lies, they keep us from feeling that we're enough. And they keep us, they keep us feeling like we're not enough. And we say to God, why even bother with somebody like me, God? I'm a screw-up. I've hurt some people. I've caused so much pain. Yeah, now I'm saved now, okay? But there's no way no, anybody would listen to me. They wouldn't believe me. They'll just think of the person I was before I came to know you. So go, so God, if, if you can, you know. I've already got my Bible and my coffee, so you go find those important churchy redeemed saints. They'll be used, they can be used by you. They're probably spiritually better. This is one that's probably affected my life more. Um, Moses tells God he's, he's never been eloquent. He's not a good speaker. And maybe, maybe, he's, maybe he's thinking of of going back into Egypt where being in their courts, you had to be a good speaker. You had, to, you had to be eloquent. And now he's been 40 years in Midian, he's a shepherd. And the Egyptians, the Bible says, they despised shepherds. So he doesn't feel like he's gifted enough. So we tell God, God, you can't use me because I'm not gifted enough. Anyone feel gifted? Anyone know their gift? Oftentimes we look at other people who are leaders or in the church or teachers of God's word, and we feel there's no way I'd be able to serve. Maybe we hear somebody praying, 
You know, those prayer warriors. Anybody have prayer envy? I got it. It's a thing. I promise you. And you say, no, I don't pray as good as they do. Can't do it. Gifts of the Spirit and gifts of grace, as they're called in the book of Romans, they're given to all of us. And so some of us, some of us have some good ones, and maybe they don't measure up to others. And we compare them. You know, if you have the gift of showing mercy, which is probably one of the greatest ones I can think of, to people who don't deserve it, you show them mercy. Or even the gift of encouragement. And you take your gifts... And you look around, and you see somebody else's gift, and you say, man, my gift doesn't even have the charisma that theirs has. And this whole time, you just feel like you're not enough for God. And because you don't have those gifts, you're not going to be able to do anything in his kingdom. So we come back to God. And we break it to them. Why we can't be used. And how we are not the important churchy redeemed saints with all the cool gifts. We just say no. Finally, Moses says, send someone else. And this one for us can go two ways. God can't use me because someone else will do it. I've had enough. Maybe you're one that's been serving for a good while. And every opportunity that comes up, you're on it. But after serving for a while, you become a little complacent, maybe burnt out. And you look around, you see the same old faces doing the same old thing. And it's that one particular group that's always serving. And you say, you know... I've had enough. I'm done. It's time for someone else to do it. And we forget why we started serving in the first place. And we lose our direction. And finally, we have ran out of excuses and explanations and why we are not enough. And just like, me, like Moses, we turned to a plea of desperation. And we said, please send someone else. God, you cannot use me. Why would you want to? I'm not important enough. I'm not churchy enough. I'm not redeemed enough. I'm not gifted enough. Send someone else because I've had enough. You keep asking. And we're right. We are not enough. God's call to Moses was obedience to him. It wasn't about how or how much he knew of God or how perfect he can be. All Moses had to do was have the faith to obey. And that faith is talked about in the in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. And it says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And it's not about what people see. See, and this is what the ancients were commended for. And all throughout this chapter, you know, it's, it's, it has nicknames of the Hall of Faith or the Saints Hall of Fame. And it's just person after person after person. And it describes of how by faith they obeyed God's commands and they carried out his mission. And it's by faith Noah built an ark. By faith Abraham left his home. By faith Sarah conceived. By faith Moses kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea onto, like if it was dry ground. And by faith, Rahab, she did not perish because she hid the spies at Jericho. And each of them, not knowing God's plan, 
or how God's plan was going to work, they didn't wait to be spiritually better. None of them perfect, however, all of them faithful. So as we go back to Moses, God never acknowledges Moses' inadequacies. Whoa. Where Moses says, I'm not important enough. I don't know you enough. They won't believe me enough. I'm not gifted enough. I'm just a shepherd in Midi- or from Midian. Send someone else. I'm not enough. And every time that he makes those claims and those, re- those objections and those excuses, God says, you're right, Moses. You are not enough. God says, I am enough. Stop waiting for perfection and start walking in my direction. He never ever says, well, you know, Moses, we'll just let you stay in Midian and learn more about me. We'll get you a nice little Bible. What translation do you want? (laughs) He doesn't say until you maybe go to school and learn how to speak again. Or maybe at a charm school. He says none of that. He just says go. Go! As you walk, you will know. As you walk with me, you will know about me. As you walk with me, you'll learn enough about me. I make you enough. You don't make you enough. I do. God does. And like the saints of the Old Testament, us Christians for today need to have the same faith to obey God's commands through Jesus Christ. We don't always know what we're called to do in the kingdom of God. And it's even scary sometimes to even think that we can be used. But are we willing to take the first step of faith, like Moses, when he was called by God from the burning bush and say, and he said, here I am. But through Jesus, we will not believe the lie that we're faced with today and say, here I am, God, use me. I'm right here. I don't know what you got planned. I don't know, I don't even know where you're going. And I don't know what the outcome is going to be. But I'm here. I have faith to obey. And as you walk, excuse me, And as we walk in God's direction, he will guide us, he will grow us, he will bring people alongside us to mentor us and to share the experiences of God and their knowledge of God to help us. And while we begin to be used by God, either through serving, leading, or discipling others, He matures our thinking, the way we speak, the way we treat others, and the way we understand his word, all through a process called sanctification. Did we hear that word a couple weeks ago from Ann Hudson? She's awesome. But all through a process called sanctification, which is just another churchy word for getting spiritually better. In uh, John chapter 14, verse 21, it says, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who, love, the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. So, By obeying the commands of Jesus, it shows our true love for him. 
And by doing that, he shows himself to us and through us. If you can this week, please meditate on that verse in your studies. And sit with the truth that you don't have to be spiritually better. As you walk in God's direction, as you're walking with him, to him, you will be spiritually better. All you got to do is obey. This, um, this lie, God can't use me until I'm spiritually better, is something that us Christians are faced with. But if you're here today and maybe you don't follow Christ, you haven't made that decision, maybe you're on the fence, you're not sure about this Jesus, you might be faced with another lie. God can't save me until I'm better. And that's not true. It's not true at all. You come as you are. Right, Greg? You come as you are. That's the reason why we need Jesus. Because there's no way you can come to God, the Father, without Jesus. We are made clean through Jesus by his redeeming work at the cross, not ours. None of us would ever march to the cross for people that were spitting on us. None of us would march to the cross calling for our death. So if that is you today, I urge you, make that decision today. Is it easy? Probably not. Is it worth it? Yep. If you are that person, I'm not going to ask you to come up or anything, but we have people who pray for us that will pray for us over here in the prayer corner. I'll be there. I'll pray for you. So as I'm closing, um, I just want to give um, one more story kind of about why this, this set of verses, first and foremost, means so much to me and my wife, um, and how it came about that I was picked to, to give a message on this lie. I have no idea, but it's just the way God works. Um, so after six months of attending Redeemer's, my wife and I were hounded by, <laughs> by a Redeemer staff, not really. Uh, we were just asked politely in an email, said, come on in. You know, we want to get couples together to lead these things called life groups. And we have already attended the uh, class uh, when we first got here called Restore, and we met amazing people. And then we um, attended the Meeting for Marriage class, which was, it was amazing. And we met more people. I met my friend Greg and his wife Susie. Um, and so we immediately didn't want to do it. At the time, my wife was pregnant uh, with our son. God bless that boy. <laughs> um, and so we kind of just said, hey, we'll be delivering um, about six to eight weeks after the life groups, life groups start. And um, it's just... There's no way we can do it. And they said, no, don't worry about it. We'll give you co-leaders. And so we were paired up with uh, Carrie and Jim Taves. Amazing people. Amazing people. If you get to know them, you'd be very, very blessed. So we said, and, and they said, um, well, we said no because we're having a baby and the house is probably going to be a mess. We're going to be getting things ready for the baby. And they said, no, don't worry about it. We'll get co-leaders and they'll open up their house and they can have the life group. So we just said, all right, okay, oh, goodness. Still don't want to do it, huh, babe? No. And so, so then we finally said, okay, 
We'll attend, but we won't lead because, listen, once again, we'll be taken off of six to eight weeks, so, you know, they'll, they'll have permanent leaders. And they said, no, no worries. Um, Carrie and Jim are okay with it. They'll co-lead with you up until it's time to drop off, and they'll take over the rest of the way. So, you said, dang it. <laughs> um, we couldn't say no, right? I mean, don't want to be. Don't want to be church jerks. <laughs> is that a thing? I don't even... <laughs> it is now. But anyways, the, the part that really was amazing is the way God works. Is because we got this curriculum called Explore the Bible, and what was the first book that we studied? It was Exodus. And we started off with the co-leading. So we started off leading that first meeting, and it had to do with every verse that we read today and it was about Moses excuses his objections and so we know real well that there's really nobody here that can't serve if you call this place home when God calls you the best thing to do is to say here I am use me so Yeah, that's pretty much my story and, and the sermon. So, uh, if you, thank you. So, we'll pray. Father, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Even though um, it didn't seem like it at times, um, I thank you for your word. And how it's demonstrated throughout your word. That yeah, we are not enough. We'll never be enough. Until you make us enough. That all we have to do is follow you, God. Be willing to obey. And say yes. And have the faith. I ask that for each and every one of us, God. That you speak to us. And as we ask you, Lord, God, what would you have us do? That you give us the ability and the power to do so. Because it's your will, your plan that we would be carrying out. Not ours. Because when it does, when, mission, when the mission is accomplished, Lord, it is you who gets the glorification. It's you who gets the glory. Thank you so much, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen.